It's ironic, you guys are here earlier, you're way early and it's real quiet, and then right when I get ready to start, everyone gets real loud. I don't know why that happens. It's not just you guys, it's human dynamics. I'm not making this up beforehand, someone caught me outside, they said, Dr. Murphy, Dr. Murphy, if there were a giant asteroid coming to Earth, how would a free market deal with that? And I just knew, I'm at Mises University, where else are you gonna get questions like that? Now, so what we're talking about today is Murphy versus Krugman, and let me just justify this topic, because I'm sure, I'm gonna go out on a wild uh, limb here and, and suggest that when Paul Krugman goes to the American Economics Association, no one proposes that he do a lecture entitled, Me versus Murphy. That probably doesn't happen. <laughs> And so, uh, and why not? Because of course he wouldn't, you know, why would he waste his time? And so some people do say to me occasionally, uh, you know, hey, Bob, how come you spend so much time? You're giving Krugman a platform. Why do you waste your time with this clown? And it's a couple things. Number one is because it's like when you play, you have a canker sore and you just can't stop playing with it. You know what I mean? It's kind of like that. It's one of those things. But also uh, it's, I mean, the guy won the Nobel Prize, and people are going to email me and say, there is no Nobel Prize in economics. Yes, yes, I know. It's the Memorial Award and so on. Uh, but he, he's probably one of the world's, or not probably, he is one of the world's most famous economists right now, just period, and certainly is a representative of Keynesian economics. And the other thing is he actually, uh, he does know a lot of theory, and so he'll at least try to put you know, some sort of theoretical garb behind what the policy prescription is that he wants you know, to, pop, to pop out of the other end of the tunnel, if you will. And so I think it is good. He does try to grapple with the Austrians. My all-time favorite critic of Austrian economics is Paul Samuelson, because he was much better versed in the history of economic thought. You know, he would quote Bambavrk and come up with models to try to show little scenarios in which Bambavrk was wrong and the reasoning flipped and what have you. But for our purposes, Krugman is a pretty good foil I like it when he talks about Austrian stuff, and we'll see later on in this talk, that because he'll say things that are specific enough that you can say, oh, you want to go down that route? Okay, well, then look at this. Right, so it's, I think it's useful. And also, uh, because Tom Woods and I are planning on doing a podcast about him, so it better be the case that it's worthwhile dwelling on him. Okay, so the, what, oh, that didn't come through well. Okay, see, the Austrians aren't very good with numbers. Okay, so <laughs> here's, Here's the ordinal ranking of my topics, and there's a lot of indifference. Uh, you can see, all right, this was, you can see how it goes. Well, these numbers are supposed to go up. So uh, anyway, we're gonna first talk about the public challenge, Austrian business cycle theory, fiscal austerity, minimum wage and inflation. There were a couple other topics I could have hit, but I know they only give us 45 minutes this year, and I know I'd run out of time. So instead of doing that and rushing, I decided just to minimize what we're gonna talk about. So first of all, for those who don't know, this actually ran, so this is, I actually was in The Economist magazine in caricature form. Uh, when they first drew this up, this was clearly a caricature and I put on some weights since then, so actually it's not that far from reality at this point. <laughs> so what this is, it was an article on, I don't remember when this ran, but it was an article um, about heterodox economics. Okay, so it wasn't just about the Austrian results, talking about post Keynesian. So if you Google The Economist, heterodox economics, I think you might be able to find this. Uh, and so anyway, it was, it was just talking about how this was in the wake of the financial crisis, and so there was some resurgent interest in so-called heterodox approaches because a lot of people thought the, the, the conventional wisdom, the orthodox economists who had been running central banks and so on, not only did they not avoid this crisis, most of them didn't even see it coming, and so it seemed like maybe we should look into the critics, the people who for decades have been saying these mainstream guys are, are, are overconfident. Let's see what, let's give a, you know, the microphone to these critics. So again, it wasn't, it was also post Keynesians and some other schools of thought. I think they might have even looked at like Marxists and so on, but the Austrians were one that they, and so they didn't mention me, but they kind of, you know, people in the new, in the know knew that this was me. And so what this is, in case you're not understanding, this is, where the heck is my, there's my laser. That's Hayek, uh, you know, challenging Keynes. And that was, this is because of that uh, rap video that came out. And then this was because of what I'm, now incidentally at first, I thought they were saying I was just sucker punching Krugman here, but I'm not, I'm tapping him on the shoulder. You see that? You can kind of see from the, from the hand motions here. So it's not that I'm just swinging when he's not looking, it's that I'm saying, hey, why don't you turn around and face me? So that's what's going on there. Uh, now what this, if you look it up, if you take nothing else away from my lectures this week, take this away. Go to YouTube and look up a tribute to my favorite blogger, Stoke the Fear, 
and move Paul's book, and those are some videos that I made, putting more time into them than into my dissertation, and so therefore, uh, I want you to go look at that stuff, and you can get an idea of this. The, the short version of this story, in case you have no idea what, what the heck is this, what's this boxing motif, I'll say it really quickly, and then I'll get out of the substantive stuff, but it was uh, somebody, it was Krugman, was really making a name for himself. You know, he won the Nobel Prize, and so all of a sudden he got catapulted to international fame. He had been famous, you know, gr had a growing name for himself in the New York Times, criticizing George W. Bush and his policies, and that's when he sort of got radicalized. And, and you know, it sounds like he's working for Al Qaeda or something. Uh, and he just, you know, he went, because in the late 90s, Krugman was a pretty respectable economist telling the layperson what was good about free trade what was the problem with a living wage and so on. So you, you would not have recognized that Paul Krugman compared to what he turned into. And so at any event, uh, of course, after the crisis struck, he was trotting out Keynesian solutions. And then he was in like a Barnes and Noble promoting his latest book at the time. I think it might've been End This Depression Now, but I'm, I'm not certain. But he was definitely in a Barnes and Noble doing like a book signing and whatever. And somebody in the crowd, uh, so I think she, she was in college, um, this young woman, you know, asked him, hey, Dr. Krugman, why don't you debate the Austrians on business cycle theory? And then she emailed me this later and told me what happened. And apparently he said something like, I know this is going to sound real elitist, but serious economists don't, you know, give the Austrians a time of day anymore because they were big like back in the 20s, but they were totally refuted by Keynes and no serious economist pays attention to the Austrians anymore. I don't want to give them a platform. And so she emailed me this, so I was like, okay, I have to somehow now goad him into a debate. I can't just challenge him and you know, appeal to his sense of scientific integrity because he just said he wouldn't do it. And so I dreamed up this idea, my debate challenge with Paul Krugman. And so what I said is, I said, hey, everyone, uh, pledge money. If you want to see me, an Austrian economist, debate Paul Krugman, a Keynesian on business cycle theory, contribute to this campaign. And it was uh, a way where you could, I mean, nowadays this is commonplace with certain like... Uh, fundraising techniques, but back when I did this, it was still somewhat novel to say, you don't have to actually give the money, it'll just you know take down your credit card with your pledge, and only if, if Krugman agrees to the debate and it happens, then does your credit card get dinged, right? So there was little risk, it was more that if we could all pool our pledges and get a big number and it happens, then you get charged. And the twist was, the money wasn't going to me or Krugman, it was going to a food bank in New York City. All right, and so, and I, and I called them and called, you know, talked to their fundraising guy and said, are you okay if I do this? Is that? And he said, oh yeah, we do all kinds of, you know, that's fine. So the point was it got up to like at least $105,000 that was pledged that if Krugman had agreed to debate me would be donated to this food bank in New York City, right? And so the idea was it would sort of put moral pressure on him that, you know, he's saying how, what idiots these Austrians are and he can't give an hour of his time so that 100000 of their money would go to a food bank. So... That was the idea, and I made a bunch of funny videos to, to go along with that. Uh, people asked me whatever happened to that very quickly. Uh, he said he wouldn't do it, and that's the, the move Paul's book. You know, we have him on a radio show saying he won't debate me, so if you want to see that. And then the, uh, the philanthropy guy at that food bank left, and his replacement wasn't answering my email, so I got the sense that they were like, yeah, this is kind of weird, and so I just dropped it. So also, there's a fine line between being funny and being obnoxious, and I thought I had crossed the line at some point and stopped. Okay. Okay, so let's talk about more serious stuff now. Austrian business cycle theory. Uh, okay, so I'm going to throw out some articles, and you'll see the relevance to this, but I just want to... So I have one, if people think of it as the sushi article because I came up with this little fable of these islanders who were making sushi, and then this, uh, you know, Paul Krugman shows up and then gives them a new way to revamp their production structure that doesn't uh, involve replenishing the capital stock. And so they, they have an artificial boom period where it looks like their living standards are going way up, but they're unwittingly consuming their capital. And then there's a crash later on, and so, you know, hilarity ensues, okay? Uh, <laughs> And so that's, and Krugman is not in a cast in a favorable light, but he, Krugman responded to, me, to this in particular. You know, he, he said something like, you know, this is the best exposition of this particular line of thought that I've seen, so okay, let me go ahead and explain what's wrong with it. So he conceded the theoretical validity of this viewpoint. He just said empirically, this isn't what happens in modern market economies, okay? So that was actually an, an improvement because up to then he had referred to the Austrian theory as like, 
the phlogiston theory, you know, meaning like this is medieval, this is crazy. And so here he was saying, okay, yeah, theoretically this is internally consistent, it's just empirically, I don't think this is what happened in the US economy. Okay, and then what, after he did that, then I came back with uh, as you, my reply to Krugman and Austrian business cycle theory, which was the Mises Daily on January 24th, 2011. So again, I'm just in this talk here, I'm gonna just go through some big picture topics and give you notes for further reading if you wanna pursue this and get the details. Okay, so what was, one thing that jumped out in this and why it's Krugman is no Paul Samuelson in terms of an intellectual foe regarding Austrian theory is one of the things that's funny, if you read this, these back and forths, uh, Krugman says something like, I'm, I'm paraphrasing, but this is close to what he said. He's, he's going through all the reasons that he's frustrated with the Austrians and why they just don't have a, a grip on reality and they don't understand modern recessions and what drives them. And he says something like, uh, you know, if, 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 it's not, if the Keynesians are wrong and this isn't about demand, well then why is it that empirically it seems that central banks have the ability to control the timing of recessions? And he just asked that, and then links to some, you know, JSTOR article where they, they empirically, some of the authors went and looked at the timing of business cycles and they found that it looked like central banks can affect when the business cycle happens. Okay, so if you stop and think about that, that's bizarre that Krugman's challenging Austrians saying, you know, how come you guys won't admit that central banks have something to do with the business cycle, right? I mean, do you, are, you, are you getting it? Like if I put it in those words? So what's happening, I think, is that in Krugman's mind, there's two types of business cycle theory. One is based on demand and you know, spending flows, and the other is, is based on real factors. And so that's, you may know this is real business cycle theory, or RBC. So it is true in a real business cycle theory approach, they think that there are shocks that happen to the real economy, and that's why there are what appear to, to everyone else to be business cycles. And in the, in the purest, hardcore, you know, right-winger, markets always are in equilibrium, always clear, everything's super perfectly rational framework, business cycles are an equilibrium rational response to changed fundamentals, okay? That, you know, there was a shock to worker productivity, and so that's why people aren't as rich as they thought they were, and so on. So that's, you know, that, that's what Krugman thinks he's battling, and so in his mind, as long, if, if, if central banks have the ability by changing how much money they're pumping in to affect the real economy, like, oh, wow, real GDP really went down. Look at that. Then in Krugman's mind, the Keynesians win, right? So he doesn't see how, um, you know, as Garrison and others would describe it, that the Austrian business cycle theory is kind of a combination of those two approaches, that there's monetary causes, but yet the effects are, are, you know, are based on real factors, okay? So it's like monetary disturbances cause changes in the underlying real economy that then have, have uh, an effect. And that's partly what I was getting at in this article, The Importance of Capital Theory. Let me just say this before I forget. Part of what I hope you get this week is the Austrian emphasis on what we call capital theory, you know, the capital goods and the capital structure of the economy. Mainstream economists don't have a model that's, that's that sophisticated or that subtle. And so you really can't even depict Misesian's, the, the Misesian theory, the business cycle in a standard Keynesian framework. Right, they, they, the, the best they could do in a normal Keynesian framework is like capital with a capital K and then consumption goods is there might be too much investment in the current period. And so that would be suboptimal because now, oh, you know, we're deferring consumption too much. Like there's too much saving this period, so consumption's artificially low. And then that just means like the time path of consumption into the future is suboptimal compared to the representative agent's utility function or something. Okay, but you can't have a boom bust that doesn't even make any sense in that kind of simplistic framework, all right? So like I said, when I, I remember when I was in grad school, I couldn't even get my classmates to see what Austrian business cycle theory was because they just, they didn't, they couldn't even handle it. Okay, uh, you guys ready for this? All right, this is, Krugman had said in one of these exchanges, and that's what I was pointing out in my reply, so I, like I said, I linked to all this stuff, you want to get the details, but let me give you the, the uh, takeaway here, one of the things he was trying to do when he was trying to blow up this, re this focus on real factors, right? So after the recession, uh, or after the recession struck, a lot of, certainly the Austrians and then even other economists who were not Keynesians were saying stuff like, there was too, much, too many resources going into housing in 2006, 2007, 
And so part of what needs to happen in the 2008-2009 period, the government and central bank need to keep their hands off and let resources get reallocated to where they're supposed to be. Right? There was too much in housing, and so that needs to, you know, workers need to get distributed and so on. There's a reallocation that needs to occur. So it, what, like I said, it wasn't just Austrians saying it. There were other people who, who were in their own way, in their own words and terminology, grappling with that. And so Krugman thought he had a trump card against them. And again, this is all linked if you go to those articles. And he showed this would have been in, I think it was like 2009, maybe 2010, that he wrote this article. And he was looking at uh, manufacturing and construction, those sectors, and looking at the change of employment. And he said, wait a minute, look at manufacturing dropped more than construction did. And so clearly this, this reallocation story is crazy, right? If these, if these real theorists were right, and the, the cause for our recession right now is that there was too much investment going into housing, the biggest drop should be in construction. But look, at it's across the board, demand is just down. So he, he thought he was showing the real culprit here is just people are panicked, demand has dropped, and then that percolated back to the system. It's a, it's a general depression in economic activity. It's, it's not concentrated per, by sector the way the real cycle theorists would, ha would have to be for their story to be right. So I came back and said, well, wait a minute. Of course, if you look at the absolute number of workers, that, that delta, you're going to see a bigger drop in manufacturing because manufacturing is a bigger sector, right? If you looked at the percentages, though, and then I just generalized it. And so look at this. This turned out even better than I was hoping. So what this is showing is, I don't know how well you can see it back there, uh, retail trade, non-durable goods, durable goods, and construction. This is employees, but it's an index, okay? So it's set that the January 2006 level is set to 100, right? So these are like percentage changes if, you, if you're you know, looking at these numbers. And so they're all set equal over here. And then and so the shaded area is the official time of the recession. And so you can see this, that construction dropped the most. The next was durable goods. The next was non-durable goods. And then the one that dropped the least was retail. All right, so this lines up. I mean, if Garrison with his PowerPoints couldn't have asked for it to turn out better than this. Right, this almost makes me want to throw out the a priori and stuff and say, just let's do it statistically. This has worked out perfectly, right? So, and but what was great about the, and this also comes from the St. Louis Federal Reserve. If you can't trust the Fed, who can you trust, right? <laughs> right. So again, that's why I love, this was using the you know the official data and everything. It's not like I had to go to the uh, you know the Friedrich Hayek Business Cycle Research Center or something with the numbers that have been through their their uh, spontaneous order filter, and so. You know this 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 turned out beautifully, and again, it's not that I dreamt this up and then checked it to make sure it worked, and then published an article. It's Krugman was the one who said, "Aha, you guys, your theory predicts this, and you're wrong. Look at that, right?" So when he thought the numbers were on his side, and then when you say, "Well, no, wait a minute, this this is actually clearly the correct way to do it in terms of percentage changes," and it came out this way. So that's why I think this is a pretty good piece of evidence for someone who likes to claim that all the evidence is on his side and the rest of us are just, you know, genuflecting before our idols. Um, the other thing, and there's a, I'm not going to move on because I want to hit other topics, but if you follow those links I gave you, there's other stuff just like this, like where he said at one point, if you thought it was about reallocation, then you would see unemployment drops would be the biggest in those states that had the biggest housing boom. And he was looking at like the last 12 months well after the recession had started and then saying, oh, but there is no such correlation. And so I went, wait a minute, if you, if you go back and you look at your time period from when the housing boom peaked, and then say from that point to now, which states have been the hardest hit, and then look at, you know, they, they lined up almost perfectly, where the states that had the biggest housing booms were the ones that at that point had the worst recession and so on. So again, it was, he made this claim, and clearly he didn't, you know, the way he tried to test it was not good. Anybody could admit that, yeah, that's not the right comparison. And when you adjusted it and did the, his own test properly, it actually verified or it was consistent with the reallocation story, not with his. In other words, if it were just general demand dropped because people were scared or they were trying to pay off their debts, you wouldn't expect the states that had the biggest housing bubbles to be the ones where unemployment shot up the most, right? There would be no, if it were just demand is down, but yet you did see a pretty tight correlation between which states got hit the hardest and which states had prior had the biggest housing bubble. Okay, uh, what about this issue of austerity? And I put this in quotes because there's a couple of things. For number, number one is, for a while at least, 
the countries that were engaged in the savage austerity, they didn't even cut their spending in absolute terms. It was just that they had, it had gone way up during, you know, in the immediate aftermath of the recession, and then some of them pulled back a little bit, right? So it was like the, kind of like the ratchet effect. But the other thing, too, is it's... Well, here, let me pull up these claims. So Krugman was saying the Austerians thought that there would be expansion, and so then if there's not, they must be idiots. There was... He claimed that these horrible cuts will lead to a double dip. And then, in particular, and I'll show you in a minute the charts he used, he said that, you know, one of his... He, he likes to throw out all this empirical evidence, and he said that Belgium was spared from austerity, and that's why it was doing better than some other European countries, right? So I'll come back to some of these and show you what was wrong, but this is the kind of um, claim he was, he was spinning. So one thing, though, is certainly no Austrian economist was saying, oh, yeah, if there's a bad recession, what government should do is jack up taxes, okay? So even if it were true that some country tried to balance its budget by massive tax hikes and then its economy faltered, that would hardly be a criticism of Austrian economics, all right? So admittedly, some sort of conservative right-wing economists were in favor of balancing the budget through a combination of spending cuts and massive tax hikes. So it's not that Krugman was totally picking on a straw man, but the point is certainly Austrians would not fall into that camp and they would recognize the distinction between reducing huge deficits through spending cuts versus tax hikes. So just be careful about that. But for one thing, in terms of the, the so-called fiscal austerity, uh, this chart is, is up through 2011. So with some of the, especially Greece, some of these countries, they really did cut their spending in absolute terms even the further along we went. But this mantra of, oh my gosh, Europe is suffering from savage austerity, the Keynesians were saying that from like 2010 onward. Okay, so this was at one point where you could see that, you know, clearly most of them, their spending was higher than it had been even at the peak of the, of the housing bubble years, okay? Now, as far as Belgium, Krugman had a post July 1st, 2014 called The Secret of Belgium's Success. So here, I'm just giving you one example. With all of Krugman's stuff, well, not all of it, with much of Krugman's stuff, all you need to do is just take his own data, his own logical argument, and just tweak it a little bit. And you can see how he's presenting something in a very particular way because it needs to be like that to fit the story he wants to spin. So in this case, again, his whole point since 2009 was we need to run big budget deficits because central banks have run out of ammunition. They've hit the zero lower bound. They can't cut interest rates anymore. And so conventional monetary policy has failed or you know, it's, it's run out of steam. And so that's why to boost aggregate demand, you need cent central governments to come in and run big deficits to offset the, uh, the saving of the, of the private sector as it deleverages. And so he would, has all kinds of scatter plots and whatever about European countries and their adjustments to their budget balance. So this is just one example of how he would do it. And so I'm going to show you this, make sure you get what his point was, and then show you another way to look at the same numbers and you'll see how the story is much different from what he was leading you to believe. Okay, so this is the change in the structural budget balance. And so it's showing, oh, look at Belgium. So again, this, is, this, is, this chart's taken from Krugman's July 2014 ar article. Percent of potential GDP. Okay, so already we're talking about stuff that you know, is, is based on some analysis of imaginary of how big could the economy be, right? So potential GDP is not something you can go measure. It's an abstract thing. And then the change in the structural balance. Where's my laser? Uh oh, I think I ran. Oh, there it is. The ch structural budget balance. What that word structural means is we're not looking at the actual deficits. We're like netting out interest expenses. Okay, so that's what that means. And so already we're dealing with two adjustments to the actual numbers. And so what he's showing here is oh, if you, using this measure, Belgium, you can see it increased its deficit, right? The, the, the budget balance got worse, whatever the time period is for this chart. Whereas Netherlands and the France, uh, the Netherlands and France, they improved their structural budget balance, meaning they got more towards a, a balanced budget, right? And so he's, because what was happening here is Belgium was outperforming these countries economically. And so he was trying to explain what's the secret of Belgian success is they resisted the calls for fiscal austerity. They continued to, they actually made their budget balance get worse compared to the Netherlands and France, right? So that's Krugman's story. And so I just knew that can't be right. It can't be that the French had a more responsible budget policy than Belgium. That can't be right. <laughs> and so I just went up and got these two things and just showed, so these are graphs are from me, just showing, look at, 
the blue line here is Belgium's spending as a percent of GDP, and this is France. So how in the world can you say that, oh yeah, this is showing that the reason Belgium's outperforming France is because the Belgians, you know, they, they had more aggressive government spending than France. That doesn't make any sense. That, that's not what's going on. And then uh, down here too, deficits is a percent of GDP. Again, Belgium's blue. You can see throughout the whole period, Belgium had a much smaller deficit as a percent of GDP. And, you know, even the, you can't even say the change, right? Going from 2008 to 2009, look at how big France's budget deficit grew compared to Belgium's. All right, and then the blue one, Belgians shrank more quickly as well. Okay, so you can see how, I don't know what time period, I'm not saying Krugman made these numbers up, but you can see that this gives you the totally wrong impression when you see something like this, all right? And my point is, this happens all the time with Krugman's stuff, that he, you can see if you look at, he'll do per capita, and he'll do this, I mean, he, he chooses things very carefully to give the certain thing, whereas if you tweaked it just a little bit, you could get the opposite impression. Okay. Another huge uh, issue is the so-called stimulus and the sequester. So here's, wait, let me, so I, I, like to, I like to say the Keynesians were wrong coming and going. So what I mean by that is 2009 with the stimulus, the so-called Obama stimulus package, many Keynesians, and I'll come back to Krugman's caveats on this in a second, uh, were saying we need this because we're gonna enter a bad recession. And then what happened is things got worse, and I'll show you specifically in a second. And then with the so-called budget sequester, when there were automatic spending cuts that kicked in, Keynesians across the board were freaking out about that. Krugman called it a fiscal doomsday device. He called it one of the worst policy ideas in US history. I'm not putting words in his mouth, that's what he said. And then the economy actually got better after that happened. And the Keynesians were all just like, wow, you can't just look at one country, I mean, come on. And so the, the point is just that they were wrong on both ends, that with the, uh, the stimulus, the economy was worse with it than they had warned would happen if the government did nothing. And then the opposite pattern happened with the sequester. They made specific forecasts about this is what the economy will do if we don't cut spending. If we do cut spending with the so-called sequester, the economy is going to do much worse. And then the sequester happened and the economy did better than they had done in their basic, you know, baseline forecast, right? You, it, it's almost as if government spending is bad for the economy. You know, go figure. But so another, but again, in both cases, they just say, well, you know, the first case, the economy, you know, fortunately, or the economy was worse than we realized, and then with the sequester, well, the economy had stronger headwinds than than we realized, and so that's what what pulled it through. Okay, so we had the specifics here with the stimulus, or yeah, the Obama stimulus package. In case you haven't seen this. This right here is from the uh, Romer Bernstein report from the Council of Economic Advisors. So in early 2009, the new incoming Obama administration proposed this big stimulus package. And so they were saying, this, so this is the unemployment rate, and they were warning. So this is where you know, they released it, right? This is early 2009. And they made this forecast. And they say, if we do nothing, unemployment's going to go up this high. And that was scaring everybody. You see, that it was going to rise and just break 9%. They said, but if we pass this Obama stimulus plan, we'll keep unemployment below 8%. Okay, so they did pass the stimulus package. And then what happened? The red lines would happen in reality. Unemployment went up past 10%. Okay, so again, unemployment was worse with the Obama stimulus than its cheerleaders had warned would happen if we do nothing. Okay, so that, again, in terms of if you want actual empirical evidence, what more could happen to justify the critics who said running big deficits doesn't help the economy than this? And they explained it and said, well, you know, the, our baseline forecast was wrong. It's still true. Other things equal that the stimulus helped. It's just, you know, the, the unemployment rate would have been up off the chart had we done nothing. Okay, and then, like I say, I don't have a chart here to show you. If you, if you want afterwards, I can give you specific things. You want to go look up and get the specifics, but with the so-called sequester, again, the same sort of thing, the macroeconomic advisors, whatever, making specific quantitative forecasts that Goldman Sachs and stuff were passing around saying, this is gonna be the impact of Congress cutting spending in this reckless fashion. It's gonna shave such and such off of GDP growth, cause, they were predicting it was gonna cost like 700,000 jobs. They did do the sequester, and then the economy did better than their baseline forecast had predicted if there had been no spending cuts. So again, it was the flip that the economy outperformed what they said 
So it could just be that there was two coincidences and that went against the Keynesians, or again, it could be that government deficits don't help the economy. Okay, minimum wage, this is also a good one. Uh, here, the 98 versus 2015 Krugman is really instructive. So he, uh, if you wanna see that this is a fantastic article, uh, it's called, which, so that if you just go Google, which do you prefer, Krugman circa 1998 or Krugman circa 2015? That's like the blog post title this guy did. It just came out like a week ago. And because what happened is Krugman just recently had an op-ed in the New York Times talking about the minimum wage, and he made a few claims. So I'll try to summarize this for you. He says, uh, you know, he admits, yes, the consensus used to be among economists, myself included, because this stuff is in his textbook, the standard story about the minimum wage causing unemployment. He said, yes, economists used to think that um, raising the minimum wage would cause teenage unemployment, or more generally, unemployment among low-skilled workers, but you, it's, it's good to look at the teenagers because that's you know, where it's concentrated. And he said, but then starting with the famous Card Kruger study, that consensus flipped. And now we have evidence, you know, rigorous evidence showing that unemployment, you know, modest increases in the minimum wage do not cause significant drops in teenage employment. And so that's no longer, you know, it's just that's, that's what the empirical evidence shows. We've changed our minds, and it'd be nice if you conservatives would, would do the same, you know, making it look like they, they're scientists because they follow the evidence, they're not ideologues. And then when he was trying to explain, theoretically, you know, how, how could this be? Is it the demand curves don't go downward? And he said, well, it's because uh, workers are human beings. They're not like the supply and demand curves for gasoline or wheat. And he says that maybe the workers work harder. You know, if you, if you raise wages, maybe they show up and they have better morale, so they produce more, so that their productivity is not just a fact of nature, but it's endogenous. Or maybe it reduces turnover, right? So if the, if the firms offer more, then they get workers who don't just show up and work a little bit and then quit, and so they always have somebody new who can't learn the ropes. If you have people there there longer, if turnover's down, over time you'd think productivity would be higher, right? So he said maybe there's that influence. So he's given possible theoretical reasons, but he said it doesn't matter what the theory is, the explanation, the facts are the facts, and this is it. Okay, so then this blog post, which do you prefer, Krugman circa 98 or 2015, went back and found, and I had, I was aware of this article, but I've forgotten the specifics, and I forgot just how damning it was in light of his 2015 op-ed. So the Cardin Krugman study came, or sorry, the Cardin Kruger thing came out, and that's the one with the New Jersey and the it was Pennsylvania. One raised their minimum wage, and so these guys called fast food places, and it, it looked like there was no bad effect, and there had been objections to that study. So Krugman in 98 is writing a book review of a book advocating for so-called living wages. Right, so that's even more than just the minimum wage hike, but to say we need to pay workers enough so they can support a family and that, that, that. And Krugman just excoriates that. And this book review came out five years after that Card Kruger study. And so Krugman in 98 said, I'm paraphrasing here, but this is the spirit of what he was saying. He said, So Card and Krugman had this, Kruger had this thing, and liberals have seized on this iffy result to say that the laws of supply and demand no longer apply to labor markets. So this is five years after he's had the time to digest their study. He's still calling at that point an iffy result, whereas now he's saying, you know, we should be congratulated for accepting the new evidence. And then he also goes through and debunks all the reasons he gave in this current piece. So in particular, he says, suppose it's true that if you offer higher wages, the employees have better morale and so they work harder. He said, well, if that's the case, the government doesn't need to force them to do that, right? It's in your own narrow interest as an employer if you're gonna pay more and the workers show up and work harder, the government doesn't have to put a gun to your head and make you earn more profit. They would just need to fax you that and say, hey, here you go, just do that, right? So that's one element. And then he said this idea of, because the people in the book he was reviewing also cited this thing about, if we pay everyone a living wage that will reduce, reduce turnover. And so you know the firms won't actually have to take a huge hit that it'll pay for itself. And so Krugman 98 pointed out quite correctly that might make sense for certain leaders in an industry, right? If you have a bunch of firms in an industry, one of them can get away with paying above industry wages to attract the best workers to reduce turnover for them, but you can't reduce turnover in the economy as a whole, right? There's always gonna be the natural unemployment rate and workers bouncing around. So it's not that everybody can get the cream of the crop, 
That, that's a strategy that makes sense for some firms in an industry, but you can't force all of them to attract the cream of the crop, right? So again, it was, when you read his two articles side by side, and he even back in 98 says, laments how it seems like some people are trying to make this an issue of morality and, and, and not realizing the laws of supply and demand apply to labor as much as they apply to wheat or gasoline. Okay, so it's, what's eerie is it's like when Krugman and now is trying to attack the economists who have this worldview, the specifics he comes up with perfectly describes himself like 10 years earlier, right? So it's, it's eerie. Okay. Uh, lastly, inflation. So oh, the Austrians predicted hyperinflation. Their model was falsified, and this guy Murphy lost a bet, and therefore he's an ideologue while Krugman's a scientist. Now, you might think, like, wow, this is pretty narcissistic, Bob. And, well, yeah, it is, but it's justified because he really did, Krugman did single me out by name, all right? Because what happened is, just to give you the quick, in case you don't know this background, so there's this guy, you know, I've, I was, since Bernanke inflated the monetary base, I was warning about, geez, this, this could be bad, this could weaken the dollar and so on. And so I was concerned about, and yes, you have to be very careful, the difference between monetary inflation and price inflation and so on. But I was saying you could expect prices to rise. And so my friend, David R. Henderson, who he writes for Econ Log, if you're familiar with that, so he's one of their main you know, normal guys in the rotation. Total free, he's not an Austrian, but total sympathetic tra fellow traveler, very free market. And he actually had done a bunch of studies praising the Canadian fiscal austerity of the 90s, right? So he was totally on board with policy prescriptions in terms of how, do you, how should the U.S. government be behaving during the Great Recession. So we were totally on this. And he made a bet with me and said, I don't think inflation, price inflation is going to be that big a deal in the next few years. And so we, you know, we took, made a bet and he was right and I was wrong. Okay, fair enough. And so then Brad DeLong and Krugman found out about that somehow and then linked to it and said, oh, these, you know, these, these Austrians, this guy Murphy doesn't even have the decency to change his model. Okay, so it's not that I lost a bet to a Keynesian. In other words, that we could have just as well said, yep, David Henderson won his bet and therefore austerity works because his model just got proven, right? Because in other words, his policy perspectives were just like mine compared to what the Keynesians were saying. So that was what was weird about it. But uh, also... Let me. So, what's the moral of the story? Is if you're going to make a public bet, make sure you don't lose, right? That'll just save you a lot of embarrassment plus money. Okay, but more specifically, what's so Krugman, who was running victory laps for years, not just about me, but saying these right wingers who are warning about Bernanke's debasement of the currency, they've just been wrong year after year. Whereas we Keynesians, our ISLM model has passed with flying colors. All right, Krugman said some version of that narrative. 50 times, I'm not exaggerating, since 2009, right? And he keeps saying, with us, with, you know, with we Keynesians, this is science, we're being empirical, our model has been verified time and again because we made falsifiable predictions, we're right. Okay, so when it comes to price inflation, no, he's not right. He was totally wrong also in the opposite direction, right? So in a blog post of February 2010, he had this chart. So he was, this was his um, it was median and trimmed. It was some version of, of inflation that the St. Louis Fed published. And so this is what, you know, Krugman, Krugman wasn't looking at headline CPI. He thought this was a better measure of inflation inertia or something like that. But the point is, this is what the chart looked like as of February 2010. And Krugman, Krugman said, ongoing process of disinflation that could, and not too long, lead to outright deflation. Japan, here we come. Okay, so you can see how the year-over-year -year change was down at 1% at that point. He was arguing it could actually keep going down and become negative because in Japan, they really did have falling CPI for a period. So when he says, Japan, here we come, he meant this is what's happening to us here. So at this point, he was predicting or warning of literal falls in the CPI year over year. So did that come true? No, this is the point where he made that prediction. You can see what happened to price inflation, you know, jumping way up almost to pre-recession levels a few months after he made that. Okay, so again, it's, he was predicting that it was going to keep going down to here, and instead it went right up there. I'll give you another example. This is Krugman from a 1983 memo that Krugman and Larry Summers wrote. By, sorry, it's an 82 memo. They're talking about the 83 recovery. And his title was The Inflation Time Bomb, question mark. Okay, and so, he, so this is Krugman back when he was on the Council of Economic Advisors, I think. And my point here is that, you know, Krugman has been wrong about inflation in different periods as well. So this, he was wrong 
warning of deflation. And here in the early 80s, he was warning of the inflation time bomb. Page two of the memo, he says, uh, we think that it might add five percentage points to future increases in consumer prices. So you can say, well, how did Krugman's model do there? This is the point at which he made that prediction. Price inflation then was about 4.9, so it would have needed to get up to about 10%. And no, it just went down like that. Okay, so the point was, ironically, Krugman was predicting the exact same thing that I was in my bet with David R. Henderson, right? So uh, anyway, I don't know if, he, if Krugman made a $500 bet with somebody, but if he did, he would have lost it. Okay, so the takeaway from all of this is that do not believe it when Krugman says the empirical evidence is on our side, all this stuff is lining up the way we predicted. It's not true with a lot of it. You can just take his own presentation and just look and say, wait a minute, why did he choose that particular metric? And if you tweak it a little bit, you see it's the opposite. Let me say, I have a few minutes left here. Let me just spend one or two minutes on the minimum wage stuff, and then I'll probably have time for one or two questions. On the minimum wage stuff, let me make sure you understand this. The consensus was, as of like 1982, people had, it wasn't just the theory, the blackboard theory of supply and demand up, you should put wages above the market clearing level, you get unemployment. They had done all kinds of regressions on US data for, over the course of decades, okay? And like as of 82, there was like a presidential commission or something, or maybe it was a congressional commission, I don't remember. And they had had some economists, and this got published in a top journal. So it, was like a, it was a review of all the empirical literature up to that point. And there was a consensus that a certain you know, hike would cause 1% to 3% drop in teenage em employment. And that was how it was. And they had controlled for stuff like business cycles and so on, right? So it, they had put in things on this, these national level regressions that you would have thought, you know, just to, to try to isolate the impact of the minimum wage. And then in the 90s, this so-called revisionist wave kicked in. And even there, though, what they do it's, it's hard for me to sort of dumb it down here for, in terms of layperson language, but d don't think that it's like, oh yeah, the result just flips. Even when you do the, with the new stuff, with the new data and so on, with various states changing their minimum wages, when you do the first level regression, it still pops out that the min hikes in the minimum wage cause employment to go down. What they're arguing, these, these so-called revisionist authors, they're putting in more controls and at some point after they add like the third or fourth one, then the coefficient on the minimum wage variable flips it, or either gets real close to zero or in some cases it gets slightly positive. Okay, and so it's, my hunch is that they're sort of overcorrecting, right? That they're, let me just give you an example of what I mean. They're saying things like, it, what they must be saying is that it's just a coincidence that states that have been raising their minimum wages have been in areas where employment's not growing as quickly for other reasons, okay? But the, the original regressions did include things like population and so on. So it's, it's like a very specific result. It's not just something obvious like, oh, if, if Florida has, a, a, or if Texas doesn't have a minimum wage law itself and people are moving there because of cheap housing or Florida's got sunshine, people are moving there and it's other states that have high minimum wages that have awful winters and so population, it's not something like that because they control for population, right? It's very particular things. And my hunch is I can't prove it right now. This is one thing I'm gonna work on when I get to Texas Tech is to try to look and see empirically, can we tease that out? But the point is, to give you an example, you could have something like, I believe, suppose when they go to raise the minimum wage, the fast food restaurants in the industry in that area, in that state, switch into more automation. Right, they get you know more drink machines where you just press the button and they just design it so they can get by with fewer workers. I think the way some of these regressions work is they would put in a variable that would pick that up and it would take away weight from the minimum wage coefficient because it would say, oh, there's this regional trend of increasing automation and that's why teenage employment's down. It's not because of the minimum wage, it's because for some reason all the restaurants in this state decided to bring in more automation. <laughs> right, you see what I'm saying? So it, it's... It's, it's pretty hard to tell the, re, you know, the regression, don't include other regional shocks that are directly caused by a minimum weight. You know, you can't, do, how could you tease that out? So again, like I say, it's even the baseline results in these new revisionist waves, they will say, look, we can replicate the old canonical result, but then when we start adding in all these controls for regional variation, then all of a sudden the coefficient on the minimum wage goes to zero or, you know, slightly positive. So that's, so, and that's what Krugman summarizes as saying, oh, all the best literature shows that, you know, there's, there's no evidence. And the, one last thing is, 
even if all those results were gospel truth, they're all looking historically at modest increases in the minimum wage. They're not looking at doubling the minimum wage, which is what would happen if the federal wage goes to $15 an hour. Some woman just put out a thing. It was, I don't know if it wasn't on Bloomberg. It was somewhere else, but maybe it was Bloomberg. Saying, looking at some, there are certain states like Arkansas where the median wage right now is below $15 an hour, right? So if they jack up the federal minimum wage to 15, half the hourly workers in that state will now, that will be a binding constraint, right? So this isn't like a little tweak. This is a huge increase. Okay, so let me stop there and maybe take one question. Yep. It, it's good. You're going to be the only one, so this better be eloquent, brilliant. Okay. So what are the arguments for why QE and QE2 in the U.S. have not led to widespread inflation? And similarly, in Europe with the ECB plan, they're, they're flirting with deflation. Right. So what? Well, I'd like to answer your question, but we're out of time. So, uh, Yeah. So the question is, how come QE didn't lead to such? Okay, a couple things. Number one is, if you define it, in price inflation broadly to include asset prices, well, of course, there's huge inflation, price inflation, right? Asset markets zoomed, and this is a little bit colloquial, perhaps, and it would have been better had I said this on the front end rather than after my particular prediction turned out wrong. But if you think about it, it wasn't like Bernanke was doing his helicopter drop and giving $100 bills to average Americans so they could go to the grocery store and buy bread with it. He was giving it to huge bankers. And so what are they going to do? They're not going to go stock up on tuna fish. They would go into asset markets and bid things up. So if you looked at the actual mechanism of who got the money, it actually you know, does seem like, yeah, they went out and invested it in various places. Certain inflation hedges like gold and whatever did shoot up, especially in the beginning when they brought in QE. So I think there is that element. And then you say, well, why hasn't it percolated out? Number one is the banks haven't been lending it out as much. And also, I think it's true that just the demand to hold cash went up, right? So in other words, had they not done QE, I think prices would have come down a lot. And so partly it was just they're offsetting what otherwise would have happened, okay? So, all right, I, we're out of time. Thanks, everybody.